So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Helen Parr, and I work for Devon Wildlife Trust on the Green Minds project in Plymouth. Um, Devon Wildlife Trust are a partner on this exciting Plymouth City Council-led project, which is funded by the European Regional Development Fund's Urban Innovative Actions uh, until the end of August this year. It's a unique opportunity to bring our experience and enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to the green and blue spaces in a large city like Plymouth. And we're doing things like training community groups with skills to monitor their patch, working with the council to see meadow improvements across the city, helping set up a tree nursery at Durford Community Park, uh, and encouraging people to take action for insects and other wildlife by looking at some alternatives to the use of pesticides. And so it's just a few little snippets of what we're doing. Um, you can find out a lot more if you visit the greenmindsplymouth.com website uh, and there's lots about what we're doing and other events too. So we're trying to make help to make space for nature while helping local people reconnect with the natural world and getting all the physical and mental health benefits that we know that can bring. So it's all a win-win situation really. So on to this evening's talk. Um, we're going to hear um, a bit more about the blue side of things in, in green mines, because we, we do a lot on the meadows and the verges and the green spaces and parks. Uh, but obviously, we mustn't forget that you know, Plymouth is surrounded by uh, blue sea and the rivers and the estuaries. So let's um, hear a little bit more about uh, the bigger picture of that uh, from Harry Barton, who's the chief executive of Devon Wildlife Trust. So over to you, Harry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. Uh, first of all, just checking that uh, people can hear me. So if I don't hear anything back, uh, I will continue talking. Yeah, I can definitely hear you. So I'm assuming everyone else can. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, so so no, great to talk this evening. Um, the, I gave a talk a, a little while ago, and that was uh, very much about protect how we can restore nature on land. And we so often forget uh, to talk about the sea, but actually our marine environment here um, around the southwest is just as important, if not even more important, diverse, certainly in a European context, than what we have on land. So it's absolutely critical that we don't forget what goes on beyond the coast, uh, beyond the coastline. And if I can get to my um, thing, my uh, slide to move. Ah, here we are. Yeah. So this is how almost all of us. Uh, access or think of the sea we think of the coastline and we have some incredible coastline of course in Devon so on the left uh, this is a, a picture of some of the north Devon coast absolutely stand, standing one of the best bits of coastline in Europe and you see woodland coming right down to the um, to the sea there you think you're in some sort of tropical paradise um, and, um, and, and, the, and the island there and on the right you've got my, my, what's actually my local beach which is um, uh, Bantham and Bigbury and you've got Bear Island there uh, obviously the the, uh, the famous Agatha Christie, and then there were none. That was all based in that in that hotel, and uh, these. Uh, and you see also the the, the sandy, uh, the cliff habitat, and the rocky outcrops, etc. So this incredibly diverse coastline we get. But of course, there is so much more to our marine uh, environment than that. We have, for instance, our estuaries. So uh, we've got many estuaries here in Devon and also in Cornwall. This is a rear. So this is uh, an estuary of, uh, that was probably cut down by the river, I don't know, over, over several hundred thousand years. And then because of geological uh, changes and also sea level rise, sea has come right inland. And here we are, see top nest in the middle distance there, that's 11 and a half miles inland. And we've got a series of these rears. You've got this one here in the dark. You've got the one in Kingsbridge and Sulk. And we've got the one on the Fowl, the Plym, of course. Um, the Plym and the Tamar there. Uh, and each of these has its own um, special, has its own very special wildlife. And these are in some of our most important habitats in a European context. Um, and then if you go out to see a little bit, you've got a whole raft of extraordinary habitats. So these are kelp beds, some of the most productive uh, ecosystems in the world and in fact the UK has the most uh, diverse kelp forests anywhere in Europe and we know that these have an incredibly important role to play in carbon sequestration this is a recent study in Australia and it found that of all the habitats in the whole of Australasia uh, that uh, that if you took all the contribution of all the habitats the rainforest the you know all the all the other things they've got in Australia 
that the kelp beds, which cover a very small part of the whole of Australasia, contribute one of 30%, so nearly a third of all that carbon sequestration. So that just indicates how important they are as a habitat. And then, of course, the seagrass beds. What I love about the seagrass beds, these, these grasses, Zoftera, uh, the only flowering plants that we know that have, uh, have adapted to this full-time marine environment, this wonderful tube worm in the, in the foreground here. And just like the, the big grasslands on land, these are incredibly important for a whole load of other animal species which live there, not least our two native species of seahorse. And going a little bit further off then into, into, the, into, into the rocky reefs and the other, the other reefs, uh, you get this wonderful collection of, of, of habitat, of, of, of species, absolutely unbelievable, these pink sea fans, um, all, all kinds of, of things. And what's remarkable to me about this is not just the variety, but it's what you're looking at. Everything you see in that picture there is living. This is an entire living thing that you are looking at here, not just the odd thing clinging onto a rock. So this extraordinary mixture of habitats. And of course, this extraordinary mixture of habitat means that we have an extraordinary mixture of species that live off them. So here we are, these cuttlefish uh, getting uh, excited with each other. Um, this extraordinary uh, snail, um, courtesy, I think this one, Paul Naylor. Sorry, Paul, I should have put your a credit, photo credit to you on here. But this incredible uh, a mixture of, 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 um, of species. And it's not just the ones, of course, out in the sea. It's also an awful lot of species on the land rely on these as well. So this is uh, Bowdoin Green Marsh. And you can see you've got the little egrets. Um, you've got, uh, you know, widgeon, rank geese. Um, what else we got here? Curlew, we've got knot, um, and um, uh, the black-tailed godwick here. On the, I just put that there because when we had a, a, a trip up the, the X estuary just before Christmas, and we saw enormous numbers of black-tailed godwits, few bar-tailed godwits as well, and uh, equally impressive numbers of, of avocets. Can't see any avocets in the picture here, but they're, they're all there. And, and these are all species that re require the marine environment um, uh, in order to, to survive. So it is so absolutely crucial for us um, and, in, for, and for wildlife. And in terms of the, um, the marine habitats, I've talked quite a lot about the coastal ones, but uh, in very simplistic terms, as I'm sure lots of you know, uh, we talk about the pelagic habitat, or the pelagic biome, if you like. Now, this is all the water column, and this is by far and away the biggest, single biggest biome in the whole world. When you think how deep the sea is, um, and how extensive it is, uh, it's by far, the, by far the biggest biome and it's where most of the fish live. And here we are, so this is a, a, a sort of infographic about, about um, the, the, uh, the pelagic biome. So um, epipelagic is the sort of the shallow waters up to about 200 metres. And around the UK coast, of course, we have very few places where it goes below 200 metres because what, when, uh, what the seas around us are all on the continental shelf which is just, just below sea level. You have to go you know, a few hundred miles off, off the coast into the Atlantic before you really get the steep drop off and down. It's the, the abyssal plain. And the sea gets so deep, as we know, if you go to the Marianas Trench and Challenger depth, um, you're, you're, you're looking there at 36,000 feet. So if you dropped Everest into that, um, that uh, canyon, uh, it would, its, its summit will be more than a mile below the surface of, of, of the sea. So this is um, really, really amazing size and scale that we're talking about. And then the other one, uh, as well as the Bellagic, is, is the benthic habitat. This is the sea floor habitat. And uh, for most of us, this is really shifting muds. And around the UK, this is probably the single most extensive habitat we've got, so shifting sand and muds. And that's really not surprising because here near the continental shelf, you've got all the rivers emptying the, the sediment over hundreds of thousands, millions of years into the seas around us. And this builds up this sediment. And the places in the, you know, the, in the deep ocean uh, floor where this sediment, there sediment can be a mile deep. And of course, it's gradually compresses over time and forms rock. And if you look at the mudstones, which are very common in North Devon, uh, they are that that's what that, that's how these originate. Basically, these, these these muds which form at the bottom of the sea, gradually compressing over millions of years and then later on being uplifted and, and becoming exposed on land. 
but of course they're far from inert habitats they uh they are they may not look very spectacular and the, and the things that live there may not be very charismatic but in terms of the diversity of species there um, it's extraordinary so over a million different species yes they're mainly worms and clams and small stuff but um astonishingly important nonetheless and incredibly incredibly productive the very base of much of the food chain in in our, our marine sense. And one of the things that really astonishes me about the marine environment as well is just how old it is. Um, and I was trying to think about how try, a way of illustrating this. And so just by, by, by way of, of, you know, just a, an interesting fact here. So, mo so most of the, the time when um, flowering plants and mammals and birds really took over the world not they evolved a bit earlier than this but when they really took over the world was after the after the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago and yeah they they were around a bit before then but they were do way dominated out dominated by by lots of other species so their, their, their heyday starts about 65 million years ago these seaweeds go back 1.3 billion years so um, I was you know, thinking about how you can illustrate this in time. So I was thinking, all right, if you if you think of one meter as a hundred years, so where I am here, uh, where I'm sitting on my seat, if I go back a hundred years um, I, uh, to the time around the end of the First World War, I'd say I go back one meter, and my back would be against the wall behind me. If I wanted to go back a, a thousand years to sort of William the Conqueror's time or thereabouts, uh, I would go. That would be. Um, 10 meters back and that would take me to the to the end of the office going the other direction uh, first humans around about 200,000 years ago that would take me somewhere in the middle of exeter if i wanted to go to the point in time uh, where these the, the, the most of the plants and animals we see today that dominate the world really came to dominate the world would be going here would be going to edinburgh so about 400 miles away that takes you to that time if you want to go to the point where seaweeds first evolved, I wouldn't be going to Edinburgh. Uh, if I started here, we would go to the very bottom of South America. That's where we'd end up. So this is more than 20 times the distance back in time compared to where most of the things that we see on land first really came to dominate. So it's astonishing the time scales we're looking at here. Most of the stuff in the sea is very, very ancient compared to what we see on land. Now, um, that's a bit about the background of our amazing marine environment. So how are we be treating our marine environment? Oh dear, this is where it gets slightly less positive, I'm afraid. Well, this is a picture, this is, a, or an infographic, sort of trying to illustrate where our most productive seas were in about 1900. So never mind about the, the what, what these colors mean, um, what, what these colors actually d demonstrate, but but just red, red, basically means the most productive seas. And then you go through your yellow, green, blue, and then finally to the pale. So the pale bits in the middle of the ocean, so very unproductive seas, and the reds are sort of super productive. And of course, you get this huge area off the east coast of America and of North America, so the States and Canada, and some very productive areas as well off the, off the west coast of Europe. So there we are, UK looking okay, because we haven't got too much red, we've got a nice bits of orange and yellow there. So we're, we're you know, pretty, pretty much at the sea. So there we are in 1900. That's 2000. Oh dear. Um, so we have lost pretty much all our, our very large productive areas in Europe. There's some, some shadow of what they used to be there still off the East Coast of North America. But that is an extraordinary um, decline that we've seen over a century. Um, now, uh, in that was 2000. Now, in 2012, the common fisheries policy uh, was uh, a new uh, was was updated, and it was a lot better. We had things like concepts like total allowable catch starts to come in, and action on discards and things like that. Great news because this was stuff that we've been campaigning for for a long, long time. But of course, uh, and, and although I know we've left the EU and the common fishery policy doesn't in theory apply to us, a lot of these principles have been adopted into uh, the Fisheries Act in the, in the UK since we left the EU. But of course, not all goes to plan. So this is intended to show uh, who are the worst offenders in exceeding their total allowable catch. So you can see there from in terms of percentage, there's Sweden right at the top, way above, uh, over and above everyone else. United Kingdom second, and then they line up Ireland, Denmark, etc. 
Uh, so the worst offenders, but look at that column on the right where it says excess total allowable catch. That's what the TAC stands for. And we are second below Sweden. But if you look at the size of that 107,000, 107,000, yeah, we are way, we're more than double as bad as the next worst offender, who is Denmark. So the UK is responsible for far more overfishing in European waters than any other country. And you can see why this happens. This isn't actually a UK registered boat. This is a Danish registered boat. And uh, but more to the point, it sails all the way around uh, the seas, not and not just around Europe. But this this boat can stay out in the open ocean or in the seas for months on end. Uh, it has this enormous net which can sweep up, you know, it truly frightening quantities of fish. And it can process them on board, freeze them, and store them on board. And this means that, you know, this is really a floating fish factory. This came down the English Channel um, about four years ago. There's a big hue and cry, and it moved off elsewhere. But beasts like this are increasingly um, circumnavigating the globe and hoovering up everything behind them. They can find out, they can use sonar, find out where the fish, the, 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 the really um, large fish shells are, and they can head for them, uh, targeting them very, very carefully and very ruthlessly. Um, and as a result of not just this, but generally the increasing fishing pressure, uh, we've seen not just a reduction in the overall number of fish, but a reduction in the size of fish. So this was a rare called bluefin tuna caught in Scarborough in 1933. It's a wonderful picture, which I, uh, I well, not wonderful, it's a very, a very poignant picture, but it shows the average size of the fish declining, declining, declining. I couldn't find it. It's gets from that wonderful Camel Roberts book, but it shows this is the biggest fish caught. And then as you go on through the, the, the 40s, the 50s, 60s, it gets smaller and smaller. And then eventually bluefin tuna is no longer a commercial uh, species. And then it disappears altogether. Now we get very excited when every once in a while the blue from tuna comes back into our waters. But this is the kind of thing that we've been catching 80, 90 years ago. And one of the problems here is this concept of fishing down the food chain. So, uh, you know, food webs in the uh, in the ocean are just as complicated as they are on land. But very basically, what's happening is that we go out there and you catch the big fish, the, big, the, the biggest beasts in the sea. It may not always be fish, it could be whales, obviously, but the, the, the biggest beasts in the sea. You catch them, these top predators. And then what happens is when their population collapses or disappears, the next thing down, the thing they can be predated on, that increases in number. So the fish industry thinks, yeah, hey, now we've got a bumper crop of another thing we can catch they will get caught until they their numbers collapse or disappear. And then you go down to the next level. So you go through the fish, then you end up with squid, uh, and then eventually you get to a point where there's no or virtually no uh, commercially viable fish stocks in the sea, and you end up uh, looking at what's in the sea bed and doing this kind of thing, uh, which is which is scallop dredging. Um, so here we are, we're, 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 now, we're looking at scallop treasure. This is, uh, we're, we're very well known for this in Devon. So Brixham Harbour has uh, got, is the home of a lot of the scallop dredging industry in the UK. It is one of the most destructive industries that we know of. Uh, this is basically what happens. Uh, so uh, these big, effectively giant metal cones are scraped along the sea bed and they dredge up stones, uh, anything living there, um, and scallops as well. Very profitable industry and very destructive industry. Uh, a reef that starts off looking like this after the scallop treasures have gone through can end up looking like that. This is a particularly shocking example, although it doesn't relate to Devon, this is North America, but this happened in a marine protected area. And as you can see, it's just like deep plowing thing. Um, and if you deep plow your land every year, you're not gonna get a forest going back there. So, very, very concerning and a, a, a very big part of the fishing industry, particularly in the Southwest. It's not just overfishing and scallop dredging uh, and, and things like that. Pollution is, I'd say, the next biggest of the, uh, of the threats facing our oceans. So uh, a lot of this is due to plastic. That's got a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, attention. In the media, some of a lot of it's you know big visible plastic. A lot of it is plastic that we don't see, or we could hardly see or notice because it's so small, little beads. Eight million tons dumped in the sea each year, and it doesn't just affect seals. Uh, this is this actually isn't plastic. This is ghost gear. So this is discarded gear from fishing nets uh, snagging here. Um, you know, a, 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 a dolphin. Is that a dolphin? No, it's not a whale. 
don't see what that is. Anyway, someone someone who knows more about uh, marine megafauna in the audience will recognise that, and I'm afraid I can't recognise that with all its uh, with, all, with the poor beast with all its um it, its 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 gear and tangle on it. And uh, and this is this obviously is one of the great tragedies, not the biggest uh, tragedy facing our oceans, but perhaps one of the most visible ones to us. A less visible one, but actually one that affects uh, a larger proportion of our wildlife is this, uh, and it's the uh, the state of our rivers. And most of the pollution going on in our seas doesn't actually originate from activities based in the sea, like fishing. It originates in our rivers. You look at Devon and Cornwall, not one single one of our rivers in Devon and Cornwall meets good ecological status. And we have, you know, as we know, it's been well publicised, the issues with uh, combined sewage outfalls like this one, uh, where, you know, in conditions of flood, sewage, effectively raw sewage, ends up in the rivers. And we hate it being in the rivers, but of course it soon finds its way into the sea. And even more serious than that is the runoff from agricultural land. This is the single biggest cause of pollution in our rivers and, and arguably our seas as well. Now, this photo was taken uh, just after those big floods we had, if you remember, 2013 14. So, uh, about nine years ago, we had one of the wettest, stormiest winters ever. Um, and you can see, particularly if you look at the River Severn there, it's just brown. And that is all the topsoil from farms just washing down the river and ending up in the sea. And it gets dumped. That's, what, that's where it gets dumped with all the agrochemicals washed with it, as well as the excess nutrients. And yes, there's a cost to this for farming as well. Three million tonnes of UK topsoil lost to erosion. That's each year. That's an average year, not an extreme year like this particular one. And then the third of the three big threats to our oceans, as I see them, is climate change. Now, climate change, I think, is perhaps something is slightly more subtle. It's very, it's not at all subtle if you're in Australia and you're looking at the Great Barrier Reef and you're seeing coral bleaching three years out of five, or however often it's happening nowadays. Um, this is a picture of Greenland, actually, in some exceptionally hot weather where um, it reached something extraordinary, like 22 degrees, and you're seeing really, really rapid um, uh, melt of, of some of the glaciers up here. We haven't really seen it quite so obviously in the UK, but the effects are a little bit more subtle. So this is the Kitty Wake, lovely, lovely girl. Um, we lost our last population in Kitty Wake in 2015. That was just off Berry Head. We can't be sure of the reasons, but one of the reasons why um, that the populations of, of rare birds like this have been disappearing from these shores is likely to be related to the shift in their food source and the shift in their food source likely to be related to climate change and the changing ocean temperatures. So it is going to hit us. It will bring new species as well into our waters, but, but some of the more traditional British ones are going to be pushed further north and out, out of our zone. Take all these together and you are getting an increasing number of dead zones in the oceans around the world. And um, you'll see, so each of these red spots is a, is, a, is a dead zone. You'll see a truly alarming number of them there off the east coast of North America. Um, lots around Japan, a few in South uh, East Australia, Southwest Australia, beg your pardon. Um, but you also see a good number in Europe and, not, and quite a few around the, the UK coast as well. So this is where a very combination of factors means that the, the sea is all but, this part of the sea is all but ecologically dead. So, that's pretty depressing. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, the good news is that marine environments can recover and they recover can recover surprisingly quickly and a lot quicker sometimes than their terrestrial counterparts. Now, this is a picture of Lime Bay reefs. And you remember, we might, might be aware, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that about 15 years ago, there was uh, an almighty row because of the destruction of uh, these wonderful reef habitats in Lime Bay. Um, and there had been a voluntary code, and then the, I think the price of scallops went up so high that people started to be, you know, being tempted to break the voluntary code, and you started seeing a lot of this destruction happening. The area was then closed off. Within four years, you were seeing this kind of habitat come back. So the area you're looking at now was completely devastated. There was really nothing there at all. And within four years, you're seeing this. Okay, it's not pristine habitat, but it's very encouraging recovery. And of course, here under the sea, it, you, it's never completely dry. It's never so cold with frost that things can't grow. It's never so hot that things can't grow. So uh, it's a wonderful uh, growing environment. And, um, and that's I mean, one of the reasons why you see this quite rapid recovery. So there is definitely hope out there. Um, but the key thing we need to do is to protect our sea habitats, our marine habitats much more effectively. 
and we need these marine protected areas. Marine protected areas come under lots of different names and, 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 and forms, but marine protected areas is basically the idea of protecting areas from sea. And the rules really for making this work are very similar to what they are like on land. And I think we'll, we'll all be familiar with the law princes, uh, principles of bigger, better, more enjoyed. Um, and very similar here, they need to be big enough because if they're little tiny little areas, um, you know, call of an estuary or something, that's not big enough to, to, to protect the species and it's, and it's, it's all its feeding and breeding habitat uh, requirements. You need a, so they need to be big enough. And they need to be close enough so that so that um, mobile species can get from one to the other, you know, if there's a threat, or they need to to move because you know, to to find uh, food or whatever or mate. Uh, they need to be representative, and by that I mean there are all these different habitats around the UK, and we and we need to make sure that at least one example, multiple examples, of course, of each are protected, not just not not just one type of habitat. They need to be numerous enough, obviously, and critically, they need to be actively protected. And at the moment, a lot of our marine protected areas are not actively protected. I'll come on to that in a second. So that is a basic sort of rule of thumb of how we need to protect, um, protect our, make a start anyway, protecting our marine environment. And what we really need to get to is 30% of our marine, at least 30% of our marine environment protected, exactly the same as we're saying on land. Now, um, in 2009, after a big campaign, there was uh, the, the uh, Marine and Coastal Access Act was passed. Huge moment, real turning point for the, the, um, the, 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 the fate of our, of our marine, marine wildlife. And on the back of that, took a bit of time and a bit of arguing and a new, the odd new government or two, but eventually we started getting this suite of marine conservation zones designated and you can see on a map like this it's looking rather impressive so this is a little bit out of date but it's not you know it's, it's it covers the main points so you can see particularly around scotland and parts of the north sea you've got some quite significant areas not 30 percent, but it's you know it's a good start um this doesn't show all of them because some of them are, are very small so i'm just going to show the next slide and you can see here this is the area sort of close up on, on, on the southwest so you can see that actually devon which looked like a real sort of black spot on with nothing or white spot rather in the last slide nothing there there's actually quite a lot around the coast of devon but all's not quite as good as it appears sadly because um the, right, the Lime Bay Coast area, that's number 18, you can see there in the, uh, where the Devon Dorset border, that's got pretty good levels of protection. But not all of these, not all of these are very well protected. So this big uh, dark uh, blue area here, blue grey area, which connects uh, North Devon and North Cornwall to South Wales, uh, that's protected uh, for the harbour porpoise. It doesn't protect anything else. Um, and you're, I rather like to think, I'm sure most of us, with the harbour porpoise would be safe wherever it is in our seas. So this map it, it implies greater levels of protection for wildlife than is actually the case. It's a bit like saying we've got a huge nature reserve here in Devon. Um, it covers all of Devon. And that's the place where you're not allowed to shoot curly. Yeah, that's not exactly the same as the nature reserve. So, you know, these are, it is a step forward, but it's not uh, as far forward as we need. So we need this, this, this network of marine protected areas to become you know, more, more, more integrated deeper and, and, um, you know, and more effective. The next problem with, with them uh, is with these marine protected areas is that the UK has taken a very, or certainly England has taken a, a features-based approach. And so it looks in, uh, at these areas and it says, where are the key, what are the key features within these areas that we want to protect? And a classic example of where they do that is with reefs. So they will say, okay, there's a zone here um, and uh, and there's quite a lot of reef habitat, and between the reef, we get quite a lot of mud and shifting sediment and that sort of stuff. So we don't mind what happens there, but the reef, the actual physical reefs themselves, we want to protect. Um, and this is a real problem, and I haven't got a very good way of illustrating it, but I thought I'd have a go with looking at looking at this. So this is this is the um, the Masamara National Park, so on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. And here along the Serengeti, you've probably got as big a concentration of charismatic land mammals as you'll find anywhere in the world. Elephant, giraffe, lion, rhino, hippo, you name it, it's there and in large numbers. Um, it's 30 years since I've been here, but what I do know is that you travel around large areas of this and you won't see very much, and suddenly you will see quite a lot. So there's big empty spaces. It's not like, obviously, like it appears on a David Attenborough film, big empty spaces. They're needed to sustain these large animals. Now, if you really want to see something, uh, you're, it's probably best 
place to go, our best advice to go to one of these, one of these rocky outcrops. You'll often see lion and other species there hanging out, um, very visible. Um, you could come along and say, right, well, the real interesting features where we're mostly like sea life or uh, wildlife is in these, these rocky outcrops. So we'll protect them. And never mind about this, this grassland, because this grassland isn't very interesting. It's the odd bit of acacia scrub, and then a few species of grass, not very exciting. But if the, all, all this, um, this grassland goes to intensive agriculture, all these animals, which you may or may not see in a rocky outcrop, will disappear. And although it's a slightly crude analogy, it is very much the same with this feature-based approach. It's no good just protecting the features. You have to protect the areas around it, although the wildlife from those features will be isolated and it will eventually disappear or at least be severely degraded. So we've got to rethink how we manage and how we protect within these marine protected areas. I mentioned earlier on about how effectively managed they were. Now, this is data related to the environment agency. It's not related to IFCA's or Marine Management Organization. I couldn't find that data, I'm afraid. But what you see here, particularly on the right, is an absolute um, decimation, if you like, or huge decline in the number of charges being brought to court. So 2011 to 2018, um, the uh, 2018, the numbers of prosecutions brought to court for pollution by the environment agency was 10% or thereabouts of what it was seven years earlier. Um, and at the same time, our rivers have been getting more polluted. Now, this is down to a lot of reasons, mainly lack of funding. But it's, I, I think, for you know, anecdotally, it's very similar on what's happening in our in our marine environments. It's difficult and it's expensive to monitor what's going on and then enforce it. How do you prove that the damage was done by a particular boat at a particular time? It's very difficult. You know, VMS vehicle monitoring system can help a bit, but you can't always always prove it. It's difficult. So uh, we are we we got an awful lot of work to do to make sure that we monitor this and enforce it better. Now, uh, Wildlife and Countryside Link. Uh, this is a, a, a an organisation that represents a lot of environmental NGOs. They did some work on this recently, and they looked at how effectively we were protecting land uh, on uh, uh, protecting wildlife. Sorry, on land and at sea. And they looked at two things. They said, okay, first of all, how much land and sea is legally protected? That was the first question. And they said, of that, how much of it is effectively protected, which means that the, the, you can't, the people aren't just going in there and breaking the law and getting away with it. And they came to the conclusion that on sea, it was 8%. So 8% of our marine environments around England, this is Scotland and Wales, this is just around England, 8% is effectively protected. In Cornwall, 7%. Uh, I'm not sure what the figures are for, for Devon, but I'd imagine they're very similar for Cornwall. Um, and the very fact that we don't know that for sure just shows how much more we need to we need to get data for, for what's been going on. And the target is 30. So we have got to more than treble, nearly quadruple, um, the area uh, that we are effectively managing uh, for marine wildlife in England. Now, that's not the end of it, because we also need to look at what we are protecting for. So all the marine conservation zones that we have uh, in the uh, around English shores at the moment are looking at the sea floor habitats. So looking at the reefs, uh, the muds, the shifting sands, the whatever they might be, seagrass beds, the kelp beds, etc. So looking at what's on the sea floor. But an awful lot of our ocean is is you know it, 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 what needs conserving is in the water column, the pelagic habitat. And we have about 17 species of charismatic megafauna. You'll see three of them here, the white beak dolphin, the humpback whale, the, uh, the basket shark. These are all species which would frequent our waters in the UK. They may be protected as an individual species, but what we're not protecting, uh, in, as in that you're not allowed to hunt them, but what we are not protecting is their feeding grounds, their nursing grounds, their breeding grounds. Absolutely critical. And if you don't protect them, it's like horseshoe bats on land. It's very all very well saying you can't destroy the maternity roost. If you destroy all the habitats on which they feed, they're going to disappear. So we need to look at areas where we can we can protect them. We've identified uh, an area that's about a thousand square kilometers uh, in Lion Bay. Not it's 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 much further south and much larger than the Lion Bay closed area, close to scallop dredging. This is this is an area which is not the the sea floor habitat itself isn't that interesting. There's quite a lot of wrecks there because the boat sunk in 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 World War Two, and they're quite interesting uh, in artificial reefs. But this is the really exciting thing. Uh, this isn't actually taken. This is this is take, taken from somewhere else, but to illustrate the point of a of a a, a marine front. 
So these are very like atmospheric fronts where you get in the atmospheric fronts, you know, the ones that cause our weather and our rain and our storms, where you get two different air masses, a different temperature, different levels of humidity, et cetera, and they meet and then one gets pushed up and the other gets pushed underneath and then you get condensation, all sorts of exciting things going on. Very similar concept at sea. So here we get two waters, two bodies of water, different levels of salinity, different temperatures, and you get the upwelling of nutrients. And that upwelling of nutrients causes uh, an explosion of productivity and that brings in uh, all sorts of fish and others and these charismatic marine megafauna um, uh, as well. So, so protecting large areas for these is absolutely critical. We haven't got any of these in the UK at the moment and we need them. So protection for, for, for mobile species. And even more important than that is highly protected marine areas. So these are areas where nothing is allowed to happen at all, which will damage uh, the marine environment. You'd think that that was what was the case in the marine conservation zone, but it's not. An awful lot of, of, of commercial activity happens in marine conservation zones, just not things that are supposed to damage the seabed habitats. There's one of these in UK waters at the moment, and it's a small area off, off Lundy, the Isle of Lundy. So we're very lucky to have it in Devon. And boy, has it been effective. And you've seen recovery of all sorts of things, particularly crabs and lobsters, because they can recover quite quickly. But an extraordinary mixture of habitats. But it's just one tiny area off, off Lundy. It's just a few square miles. It's nothing. Um, you know, you wouldn't, it would be a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of 1% of, of, our, of our, our English waters. And the beauty of these um, highly protected marine areas or no-take zones is that they can allow entire marine ecosystems to thrive and to recover. And that's not just benefiting the wildlife, it also benefits, uh, it benefits the fish species as well. So fish are able to, to reproduce, to spawn, grow to their adult size. And that's critical because if fish don't grow to their adult size, they cannot breed and then fish stocks collapse absolutely critical that we have those. And loads of evidence shows that where this has happened elsewhere in the world, uh, the fish catch around the edge of these no-take zones or highly protected marine areas goes up significantly. So there are huge benefits for the fishing industry as well, long-term. So uh, it's not just about what we do out in the sea, of course, it's also about what we need to try and change in our coast. And sometimes change happens by accident. Now, this is a Devon Wildlife Trust Nature Reserve. We became the proud owner of this uh, about uh, just over three years ago. We bought it in 2019. Now, until 2017, this had all been semi-improved grassland. A bit of grazing there, a bit of um, rough wildfowling went on. And then uh, there was an attempt to restore the sluice gates in the far end. You can't quite see it in the, in the, in the distance there. And, and they went a bit wrong. And the people doing it ran out of money. And there was a breach of the sea defences. And within a few months, it looked like this. It had turned dramatically um, transformed to this new habitat of shifting mud. And you can see a bit of salt marsh forming in the, the top right-hand corner there. That area of salt marsh has now at least doubled in size. It's covering a large area of this area now, of this habitat. I was up there three weeks ago. We saw two and a half thousand um, golden plover and the these huge flocks weaving around. It was the most extraordinary sight. Um, and that's the sort of recovery that can happen if, if, if this happens. This is only 200 acres. It's a tiny area of Devon. 200 acres. It, was, it wasn't even planned. It was an accident. Um, but it shows what can be achieved. Now, of course, you can't rely on accidents on our coast. Uh, we need to do more. We need to do deliberate things. Now, this is uh, the same story stood on its head in many ways. This was used to be a Devon Wildlife Trust Reserve until 2007. And then our landlords, uh, Clinton Devon Estates, decided to take it back in hand when the lease came to an end. Um, but uh, they did it for a good reason, because what they have done since, they've taken a long time, took a long time to plan, but what they've done since is come up with this plan to restore the whole of the lower rotter. What they're planning to do in the next few months is to, is to knock a hole in the sea defences here, and the whole of this area going up a mile or so up river to this uh, will, will revert to salt marsh, mud flats, and basically this uh, intertidal uh, series of habitats. Um, it's very big, very bold, and very controversial and expensive as well. But we do need to do this deliberately as well. And I think we should see, we will be seeing some really exciting changes uh, to our coastline as a result of this, uh, of this like this. Um, yeah. Deliberate intervention um, just beyond 
our, uh, the, the, these river estuaries as well is physically important. But I, sh I think I showed this slide at my last talk, but it's such an inspiring example. So this is the Sussex Kelp project. And kelp used to be very common along the Sussex coast. It was largely destroyed in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And by the end of the 1980s, there's only a few tiny bits left. Um, what uh, this project is done is it's a secured agreement from the fishing bodies and others that there will be a, a, a nice fat um, area if you like bound all the way along the coast where no none of this mobile gear is allowed to damage the sea floor so it's an exclusion zone if you like and then they've mapped all the areas the remaining fly, uh, areas of kelp and they're taking action to try and restore kelp beds so hopefully over the next probably take 30 years or so we will see a really large and impressive scale recovery of kelp all the way along sussex coast and we are thinking very hard about similar kinds of projects here on our devon coast as well This is a project that is, uh, it, it, this, this is um, a European funded project looking at uh, uh, restoring salt marsh, another of these literal habitats that we have in Devon. And on the top left, you see the first example of this happening in Essex. Uh, so this is the Aberhalls farm uh, in near Tullesbury. And in 1995, you can see them here knocking a hole um, and uh, in, in the sea defences, in comes the seawater. And it's a fairly modest area. I think it was about 40 or 50 acres of land reverted to um, salt marsh. Very exciting. Here's something we're doing on a, a, it's been doing for the last 10 years or so on a smaller scale. This is South Devon Marsh. This is a, a DWT nature zone. And thanks to a sluice gate, there's a tidal sluice gate rather than a hole locked in the, in the sea defences, you'll see the salt marsh restore as well. But um, the plan is that right the way along the coast, Devon is one of the counties involved, but there's much larger scale stuff going on in places like Lincolnshire and Humberside uh, that we'll see you know, efforts to, to, um, to restore salt marsh all the way around the UK coast. Again, very exciting. But protecting and managing our marine environment shouldn't just be about wildlife conservation. Now, uh, a number of you may have heard of the Henry Dimbleby report uh, that was uh, published uh, a year, about uh, 18 months ago or two years ago. And Henry Dimbleby uh, came up with a national food strategy, which sadly hasn't been adopted, or most of it hasn't been adopted by government. The Henry Dimbleby answered the, or attempted to wrestle with the question, I should say, the very difficult question, how should we look at land use strategically in the UK? Because if you add our demands for housing and food, uh, farming, forestry, nature and everything else, we need two and a half or even three United Kingdoms. And we're not using most land in the way that we should. We're using a lot of land very inefficiently. And he, came, he proposed this sort of three part model. So a third of land for nature, a third of land for intensive farming and food production, and a third of land for extensive wildlife friendly farming. Um, yes, simplistic, but as a model, there's an awful lot to commend it. And I think we need to be thinking the same ways at sea. So at the moment, most of it is a free for all. And there's a few areas we're identifying where we're trying to conserve with very levels of effectiveness. But the third element has got to be sustainable harvest. And this is seaweed harvesting in Zanzibar. It's farming. It's not about nature conservation. This is farming. It has nature conservation environmental benefits for sure, but that's not its primary goal. And we need to be looking at this kind of thing off our shores in the UK as well. How can we manage, manage the sea sustainably as opposed to either just take everything we can or leave the whole thing alone? There's got to be something in the middle. And if we don't solve that, you know, we, we will never win this tassel between uh, nature conservation on the one hand and the extractive industrial extractive industry on the other hand, because uh, there will always be for the foreseeable future demand for resources from our sea. So this is the critical third element. Now, going back to the Henry Dimbleby uh, thing about sustainable, uh, how, we, how we manage our land, I think we need similar plans for how we manage the sea. And a number of uh, scientists have been saying we need to stop identifying small bits of land where fishing and destructive activities aren't allowed to happen. We need to turn it all up the other way around and say we identify things where things can happen. So areas where you can fish, areas where you can farm, uh, areas where you can do other commercial things and assume that everywhere else is protected. 
Now, this this is a Scottish Marine plan. It doesn't quite do that. It doesn't do for, it doesn't go, go that far. But it is a first attempt at identifying different zones for different activities of, of fishing of, of, of marine activities in and around Scotland. Well, it doesn't go quite that far. It doesn't go anywhere near far enough. But the the idea of region, regional marine plans has that in mind. So we need to completely rethink the way we look at at, at managing our seas at a strategic level. And of course, it's not just about how we allocate land we also need a process this all sounds very boring people will go to sleep in your when you talk about processes but this is a great example so if you look at the ras fishery in devon so ras these wonderful colorful fish they've got the balan ras here the cuckoo ras a uh, number of different species and uh they are they're fascinating um and and the Plymouth sound is a great great place for them now one of the not so well known um, tenants of these these species is that they're very good cleaner fish you know they will eat parasites of others this came to the attention of the atlantic farmed fishing industry up in scotland where they have a lot of fish very close to each other and have a lot of problems with parasites so people came in down to devon and just started fishing taking these out out of the sea and taking them up to scotland totally unsustainable unregulated there's not, it was perfectly legal. There's nothing anyone could do to stop them. And it took a campaign, which we pushed the Devon Wildlife Trust to get the, the authorities to look at this and start regulating the fishery. But the whole issue here is that there's an assumption that anything goes unless someone spots a problem and complains. And actually, we need to turn that on its head and say, no, we need to assume that things can't happen unless it's proved that they are not damaging. Other things we need to do. Uh, we are we have a real paucity of uh, of data when it comes to the marine environment compared to if you look at the the number of people out there in the terrestrial environment studying moths and bats and plants and fungi and all sorts of other things insects loads and loads of great naturalists and huge numbers huge amounts of records we've got about six and a half million in the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre alone marine records not a tiny tiny fraction of that we know so much less so it's really important to gather that data and find out what's going on there this is one one example of it there's the there's the um the bottom of those dolphin consortium led by cornwall wildlife trust where a member a lot of the people on this call are probably part of organizations who are members of this but just going out there community groups um and finding out what's uh, recording sightings all that data is incredibly valuable because we need to understand more about the presence and the trends the health of species like this. Shore search, another example. Uh, so this is Wembury, um, and um, here similar similar kind of work going on in the strand line, finding out uh, what's out there, uh, what's not out there, trends over time. Are we seeing more of something? Are we seeing less of something else? Have things disappeared? What's the health of species? Absolutely critical. No one, you know, no one from government is going out doing this. This is really this is really reliant on local community groups and enthusiasts to get this information together. And this is another European funded project. Uh, this is uh, you know, preventing plastic pollution at sea. So uh, a number of countries across Europe, seven different catchments, one of them is the River Tamar. Again, getting enthusiastic community groups to go out there and try and solve, practically solve the problem. 80% of our marine plastic pollution comes from rivers. So, uh, and, and they come, they end up in our rivers, that plastic pollution ends up in our rivers because of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis as citizens. Of them so taking action against that absolutely critical again another part of the solution is innovation and uh, you know people will say you know it's fishing destructive or not and well maybe arguably to a degree it always is but it depends how it's done so uh with, with large nets and indiscriminate uh fishing then it can be incredibly destructive and you can have an enormous amount of bycatch but uh, with innovations and things like the, the, the net design and pingers, which might scare off dolphins and, and cetaceans and cleverly designed uh, nets, you can re greatly reduce things like bycatch and uh, another you know, unwanted side effects of fishing. So that type of innovation is absolutely critical as well. And I think we need to trial stuff. You know, there's lots of interesting scientific, uh, technolo technological stuff and things, pilots going on on a small scale. But we really need to trial stuff and bring it all together. And I think having the Plymouth Marine, National Marine Park here in Plymouth Sound is a wonderful opportunity to do that. You know, we can look at this strategically in terms of regulation and process, in terms of involvement of, of citizen science and, and citizens get active, community groups can be actively involved. 
um, and put, uh, new innovative techniques of doing things, we can put it all together and say, yeah, how can we, what is the combined effect of this? How much change are we making? Where are the holes? What else do we need to do? And so I think if, if, you know, if there are lots of great things that the, the Plymouth National Marine Park could do, but this to me will be perhaps the most exciting of all, looking at more, making it more than just the sum of its, its parts. And we also need uh, a different type of research. We need people who are asking hard questions. This was a, an interesting piece of research I came up with uh, when I was when I was just 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 trawling around uh, preparing for this talk. So a bit of bit of bit of work sh that's showing that basically, um, without subsidies, uh, bottom trawling would not be profitable. So bottom trawling, the most destructive activity going on in the seas at the moment, and the reason it's happening because we, all of us sitting here listening to this call are funding it through our taxes, as are people in America and all over Europe and all over the world. So we are paying for the destruction of our natural environment. And it's absolutely balmy. Now, a lot of politicians don't know this. A lot of people in the industry don't know this. A lot of us don't know it. But making, but doing this kind of work and making it publicly, uh, making a fuss about it is absolutely critical. So perhaps coming on to the last point, I th which I think is so critical, is the, is the actions of all of us as citizens. Now, this is a, a campaign we ran running up to um, the, the, the Marine and Coastal Access Act called Petition Fish. Everyone signed a scale, put on one of these fish saying, we want uh, a marine act and we want marine conservation zones. Hillary Benn, the environment secretary at the time, had one of these above his desk and it succeeded. It wasn't the only reason it succeeded, but it was a big part of it succeeding. We have got similar pressures going on today. Um, when Liz Truss was prime minister, we had a whole raft of very worrying things came through. And initially, uh, you know, like the, the, um, these investment zones, weakening of planning regulations, fracking, et cetera, um, the ELMs going back to area-based payments. Now, it was a lot of concerted effort uh, for people to try, and organisations and citizens to try and stop this. If you look at the bottom three, so the investment zones have, have largely gone on the back burner. ELMs has been reviewed, but it's actually ended up better rather than worse than we thought. And the ban on fracking has been reversed. And... Uh, that was down to an awful lot of people writing to their MPs. Which county generated more MPs, uh, letters to MPs than any other in England? Devon. Great. Thank you, everyone. But the top one here, the retained EU law bill, uh, that is still there. That is still a real threat. And, and uh, that could have all sorts of unintended consequences if that goes through unchanged. And that's why we're still pushing this campaign hard, defend nature. We need everyone to speak up for the protection of, of, of our wildlife protections on land and at sea. It's absolutely critical. But if we can do that, and if we can carry on uh, making the changes that we've been talking about uh, to marine protected areas, highly hybrid protected marine areas, marine protected marine conservation zones, uh, et cetera, uh, then it is perfectly possible for us to bring a lot of this wildlife back to our seas. In fact, it might be easier uh, than doing it on land. And we absolutely need to do that because future generations will rely on us to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you so much. Gosh, there's so much to take in there, isn't there? And there's it's sort of inspiring and terrifying in equal measure. But I think we've got to all hope and push for this sort of increased protection. And it's amazing that there's only one of those highly protected areas. Uh, it would be great uh, if we could have more more of those. So there's a couple of questions in the chat. So if anyone's got anything else they'd like to ask, we've just got a few minutes before we end. Uh, or any feedback, uh, please let us know because it's really useful for future events. Well, let me just... Do you want to unshare your um, presentation, Harry, and unmute yourself? And then I've got a couple of questions there. The unfortunate uh, sea creature that was all dead tangled up in your slide, a couple of people were say that was a basking shark. <laughs> I thought it was. And, I was looking at it and, think, and I, could, I, was, I was just trying to make sense of it, but yeah, no, basking yeah. shark. And then Thank in you. the other slide, which had a basking shark and a couple of other megafauna, apparently one of those is a whale shark. Well, I can't remember what, maybe we got oh. that slightly wrong, but anyway. Oh, I, clearly someone I'm the wrong that, person. So, yeah. Someone else should have been giving this talk, not me. But yeah, thank you very no, no. much. And what someone was asking, you know, you mentioned about the golden plover um, yeah. that you saw. What was the name of that reserve and where was that? 
So that's Horsey Island um, and it's near Barnstable. So if you if you drive out from Barnstable to Broughton um, and uh, there's a place just before, just just beside Broughton called Velator. And if you walk along, basically, if you if you um, if you follow the southwest coast path, the southwest coast path, coast path used to go around the outside of Horsey Island. And now the breach has happened, you can't. So it now goes on the inside of Horsey Island. But if you walk basically from Broughton, follow the southwest coast path uh, to, to Saunton Sands, you will go straight past Horsey Island. So a good excuse for a trip to North Devon if, if you live in South Devon like I do. <laughs> um, there's a couple of nice comments about the talk. Um, have you got any in the chat, Harry? There may be a couple of things that have directly come to you. Was there anything? Uh, you... I'll have a quick look. I see I'm, a few I'm... things fly up. Um, yeah, some may have come directly uh, to oh, you. Well, I've got something with, uh, yeah, sustainable harvest, action on water, is action on water quality. Do you partner with organisations like Surface Against Sewage? Uh, yeah, no, we, we we do. We talk a lot to them. Um, there's uh, And a lot of, probably the single biggest area of our work, actually, at Devon Wildlife Trust is related to water quality because we have 20 farm advisors and they do various mm -hmm. things. But what the majority of them do is is help farmers manage their land in a way that reduces water pollution so most of that pollution is coming from runoff from farmland so it can be things like creating habitats on steep slopes it, it can be about uh, reducing the use of pesticides and agrochemicals it's not just pesticides it's nitrates uh, and phosphates as well and uh, um, reducing slurry applications a whole raft of different things decompacting the soil so absolutely core to our work thank you okay i've, I've just got um someone another question that came to me um what are Devon Wildlife Trust proposing to practically take forward to improve our marine and coastal habitats and this person was particularly interested in what's going on anything going on in North Devon. Yeah, no, very, very good point. Yes, so we so we have uh, been rather depauperate in DWT for for a while in terms of our marine resource, and we've been trying to find external funding for it for years and failed. So this year we're just putting some of our in core resources towards it. We're in a position, luckily, where we can do that. Uh, so we'll have a dedicated marine officer. We're out there recruiting at the moment. And I'm hoping that that will push forward a number of things. So uh, getting some highly protected marine areas in Devon, it will be a high priority. Uh, trying to get a more sustainable approach to fishing and around the southwest is going to be a priority. Um, and looking at uh, you know, a regional plan to tackle pollution, um, marine pollution, is going to be another one of their priorities. So all sorts of things to think about. Yeah, that's a really positive step, isn't it? And if people are in, um, in sort of South Devon are interested, if you're interested in any of the events at Wembry, uh, at Wembry Beach and the Marine Centre there, um, if you look at Wembry Marine Centre website, you can find out about the shore search events that they're running. And they also, they I think if they do them this year, they're seashore, uh, they do some snorkeling events as well. So that sounds good. Uh, and other events like that, you could also find on the Devon Wildlife Trust website. Um, were there any other points in your bit of the chat? Any question, other questions, or was that make all of it? I've seen a few coming through. Um, I can't. I, I don't think I'll have time to scroll on all of them. But now I see it's no. something from uh, Paul Shander and Sue Ash. Thank you very much. Um, something from Paula. Polly. Yeah, I can see a few of them. Um, if yeah. we can, if we can um, keep a note of all of them, Helen. If there's any that need a response after this, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll endeavour to get back the to them. Chat along with the the talk. So yeah, I think we'll bring it to a close there on the dot of seven, which is very good. Um, and if people are interested, we have got an, um, another Green Minds talk uh, next week, which is a uh, urban birds. So join us for that if you like. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at another talk. And so I just want to say thank you so much to Harry for giving up your time and giving us a, a great talk. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, so thanks very much.